I was going to do some wafty chat while people feed in anyway from elsewhere in the campus. Um, so I'm getting a steady stream now of people coming to see me in my office hours, which is really, really good to see. Hopefully those who've of you who have come to see me have found that really useful and there's uh, more times next week as well the announcement should still be available on succeed those announcements have kind of they, they won't disappear until after the hand-in date on next friday but i'll put another reminder out on monday just to remind you of when those times are also it's been interesting running this module with half of it online it's kind of difficult to get a ga to gauge a sense of how much the students are engaged in it uh, what i've been really enjoying though is the, some of you have been emailing you, emailing you with questions and I've sort of been saying, oh, can you put this on the blog post on the pages that are associated with each research question? I've been answering them there and got a good, like, good chunk of now of um, questions and comments there. So if you've got questions about the essay, I would recommend having a look there. You get to them by, if you use the search facility and just search for essay questions, you'll be able to find the individual pages that'll pop up on the search. And I, it's really interesting, those questions as well. The <laughs> response to most of them, um, might be a little bit infuriating but it's usually it's up to you is because actually what the questions have so far mainly been about is actually demonstrating that the students have done a lot of reading and actually kind of at the point of oh I, I i think i know how to answer this but i'm not sure it could go one of two ways and actually given that this is like level eight course now second year it's up to you now to take that decision of like how based on what knowledge have i got how will I answer this question? It's having that confidence. And what I'm going to try and do tomorrow is, um, you'll, you'll be able to see what the inside of my um, second bedroom and home office looks like at home. Because I'll be recording a video at home, just to, very short video, just to sort of G you up and give you a bit more confidence around completing your coursework essays as well. And summarising some of the themes that have come across in the students who have come and seen me in my office hours. So you'll also get that, and I'll pop that on the blog. <clears throat> so today's essay then is about what I'm turning the urban problem and social policy, so uh, what I might, I'd call urban policy. Now I did my PhD on urban policy in Scotland, so I could bore you for bloody hours on urban policy if I wanted to. I could really get into some really, really dull nitty gritty of urban policy with you today, but you'll be glad I won't. I will try and engage you and make this an interesting, um, fun-filled and factual uh, lecture for you. When we think about uh, the urban problem and urban policy, and actually I think some of you in the room might have seen my talk I do at Open Days when this image also makes a uh, appearance. It kind of conjures up archetypal images like this. I will, this is a photo I took myself when I was uh, visiting a church in North Edinburgh. Uh, I was visit, visiting the church, it's a famous modernist building in Edinburgh, so that's why I was visiting it. And it just kind of, I was just a little mistake in photos there. Oh my god, this is like urban deprivation stereotype. This is just brilliant. You've got like the Baldwin Council House to the left, the council housing being demolished in the foreground. You've got this uh, woman pushing a pram in the foreground, and I like to imagine this a lone parent struggling by on her life, pushing her crown down the road. You've got the city in the background there. It's a kind of archetypal image of what urban deprivation looks like. And in this lecture that I'll talk through then is, well, what is the urban problem? How do the problems in our urban context uh, come about? What does it, so theoretically, but then also what does it look like in real life? You should, to show you some of the mapping from the indices of multiple deprivation across the UK to show you where is deprived and where isn't deprived. And then go on to talk about well, why, do we, why are we interested in this in policy terms? Why is this important to social policy and to our understanding of social policy? When we're talking about the urban problem, what we're essentially getting at is this co-location of specific problems in particular neighbourhoods. So you heard terms like slum properties, um, sort of a historic term really now, but that, that kind of uh, is a inappropriate term for, to, to describe desertion dereliction, so buildings being abandoned, buildings that are now collapsing, but also in you get concentrated of unemployment, so neighbourhoods where unemployment is particularly high, where the residents have worse health 
than they do in the rest of the city. That where antisocial behaviour is more common and actually becomes something that residents might be oblivious to. I will, oh, I can't remember the source of it. I saw the other day there was some re really interesting data that um, demonstrated this. It was asking people, oh, that was it, this is a report from Fife Council, and they'd asked people to rate the quality of their neighbourhoods, and they found no difference between people's ratings of deprived neighbourhoods versus affluent neighbourhoods, and five councils presuppose that's actually because the people who live in deprived neighbourhoods have got used to living with the problems they live with, they've got used to living with poor housing quality and antisocial behaviour. Also problems of poor environmental quality, the fact, as showed on the previous slide, the fact that neighbourhoods just don't look very nice. And ultimately disinvestment, so rather than investing in the neighbourhood, money withdrawing from the neighbourhood and it becoming a, a problematic. On that point about disinvestment then, we can think about this in two different ways. In terms of private sector disinvestment and public sector disinvestment. And private sector disinvestment is probably a key way that neighbourhoods end up in in becoming deprived, end up declining. And essentially this is because of the nature of goods. And now a bit of audience engagement for you. Right, so you have two examples of goods here. We have apples and we have houses. Not particularly nice houses, you'll agree, but houses. Now, as a consumer out there, put your hands up if you would want the price of apples to increase. Presuming you like apples. Anybody want the price of apples to increase? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Put your hands up if you'd like the price of apples to fall. Yay. Right. Now, put your, put your mind into the place that you own a house. You, so you, are, you own a house. Would you like the price of your house to fall? Q. <laughs> same, same line as you did before. <laughs> From the perspective of the owner, I wouldn't want the house to fall because that means I can sell it for the more so I can get more profit. However, if I was wanting to buy the house, then it would then I'd be like, why does it have to be off and so so many things I can Yeah. So, yeah. So. You'll do well in the questions in housing in the exam. <laughs> yeah, good work. Um, I was like, go for the comedy line of absolutely not. So yeah, if you are a home owner, <laughs> the, you, would, you don't want the price of your property to fall. You want the price of your property to increase because you bought that property as an investment. So this is uh, a sort of division in economics between consumption goods Apples, because once you've bought an apple and consumed it, you can't do anything with it. So you, people want the price of consumption goods to fall. Investment goods, they hold their value and you want their value to increase. So what happens if property prices start to decline in any particular area is people stop being willing to buy. They stop being willing to make that initial investment because it's too risky. And the sum total of those individual decisions is the collective problem that entire neighbourhoods become areas of disinvestment. And if you, particularly if you look in areas of English cities, uh, particularly in the north of England, I was back in my home city of Bradford a couple of weeks ago, and you see this cycle of disinvestment happening there in the inner city. But also, most strikingly, and this is a photo from Detroit, you see this in American cities where entire tranches of the city have become so risky for property owners to buy that people know that the, the, the property is just collapsing. There's just no way anybody is even going to think about buying the property because it's just never going to increase in value, no matter how low that price goes. So the market has failed there. But what we see more in... Ooh, I, I, do you know, every bloody year I remove that uh, animation and every year it's still there. Right. <laughs> Um, the animation ghosts come back and haunt me. Right, 
What we see though more in Scotland is public sector disinvestment. So this is where the housing is owned by a local authority or a housing association is rented out at affordable rents. And you see, as I say, it's the, it's the kind of disinvestment you particularly see in Scotland, but you do see it elsewhere. Now what happens here is a slightly different process where the properties basically become low demand. So they, they're just, they're either they're not the right kind of properties, they're very low quality properties, or they're houses in the wrong place, or in neighbourhoods people don't want to live in. And so they become low demand. So when they are vacant, and the council puts them up, as, um, allocates a, a, a new a, um, household to them, they say no thanks, and it remains vacant. And that mean, that then can, can be compounded by lack of investment, or often these two things are linked. If there's no demand for the property, then the, how, the, the council or the housing association won't bother to invest in that property. So, and that will add to that low demand of it. And then, with that lack of investment, you will then get abandonment. So people who have got tenancies will just say, well, it's a bit crap here. Let's say, if, imagine if you were in this block and you lived in the ground floor and the flat above, you would just set on fire. You'd just then abandon your tenancy. you just go, stop this, I'm just going to go elsewhere. And through these processes, the interlinked processes of low demand, lack of investment by the housing owner and the, um, and the wider public sector and abandonment, then you get these, it's a sort of negative term, and it's not really right, but spirals of decline basically, where a neighbourhood that was quite nice can become incredibly deprived and basically abandoned over a relatively quick period of time. So what does this look like? Where is this spatially? Well, as I mentioned before, um, in England, we tend to find this urban problem in the inner cities. And this kind of matches a theory from the Chicago School of Sociology in the 1920s, where they postulated that you get the, um, the central business district, which is full of office blocks, and then wealthy suburbs, and then you get this donut of deprivation and disinvestment around it. it tends to be quite transient neighbourhoods. And in England, this tends to be private owner occupied housing. It's that kind of, if you watch the news, it's those endless rows of terraced houses in the north of England, um, sitting in the north of England. And if it's not owner occupied, it tends to be private rented. And go back to my point about investment. If uh, the value of a property is falling and it's owned by a landlord, the landlord's not going to bother investing in it either because they're not going to get any rent back to pay for their investment. So you get these sort of cycles. In cities like Bradford, Leicester, uh, towns like Burnley, it tends to be an ethnic, ethnically diverse. It's where people come to when they first enter the country because the housing's cheap and they can't get a mortgage. And it tends to be clustered in former industrial cities and inner London. So the big industrial cities of the north of England and uh, the inner core of London. <coughs> what this looks like in practice, and you can just about make it out on this map. Though. So what we do to understand deprivation is create these indices in multiple deprivation that rank neighbourhoods based on different um, categories. And the little red blobs, if you can see, they are the most deprived 10% of neighbourhoods in England. The blue and the blue bobs are the least deprived 10%. So you can see that clear pattern there if you look very carefully, if you download the slides, you can look more carefully. And there's a slot, there's a link to a website where you can explore this yourself later on in the um, slides. So you can see in sort of the, um, got London, you can see that sort of pinky in the centre of London there. You've got um, the big cl uh, cluster of uh, red around Birmingham, sort of big industrial city. You've also got Liverpool and Greater Manchester there. You've got my old city of Bradford and Leeds and all that sort of Yorkshire bit. And there up in the top, you've got Newcastle upon Tyne and Teesside there. So all these locations of industrial decline, essentially. What, and then to go look in individual cities then, this is 
<coughs> written on that, I'm from Bradford, this is my own city. City centre there is down in that corner. So all those most deprived neighbourhoods, the most deprived tens, ten percent of neighbourhoods in in the UK that happen to be in Bradford are all there around the city centre. So it's that and that is it really completely archetypal of this. It's poor quality or well reasonably poor quality, terrace housing, Victorian uh, and the majority of the population there is second, third generation Pakistani migrants. And then if you go out to the leafy, leafy suburbs, where I spent most of my time when I was growing up, I did used to live in the inner city, but my parents fled to the suburbs, as they people do, um, when, I grew, when I was growing up, then you get the least deprived neighbourhoods, which are the bluer ones. So in one city, you've got this combination of most deprived neighbourhoods in the UK and the least deprived neighbourhoods in the UK. You also, in... A real emerging trend in England that's really interesting is seaside deprivation. And you see it in cities like Blackpool. Who's been to Blackpool here? Hands up if you've been to Blackpool. Quite a few of you. I've never been, I'd like to, I've heard it's interesting, in inverted commas. Um, and <coughs> so, get in Blackpool and I've had another map there. Um, so I'll update, I have another uh, map of, um, I've actually put in Bradford twice, um, I suppose, a map of Medway, which is just outside London. Um, what's happened in Blackpool then? Why all, basically all of Blackpool is deprived? Blackpool, you've got a lot of old guest houses, and basically local authorities in the surrounding area who have homeless people in great need, send them to Blackpool to stay, stay in guest houses. So basically Blackpool has become this concentration of the most deprived households in the northwest of England. And you see the same in the, in the map I'll update on the slides in Medway, which is just, it's basically the, the Thames estuary, it's just the east of London, sort of southeast of London. You also see that there where these towns used to be holiday towns, they're now full of guest houses and run down large houses, and they've now become places where homeless people in sort of single homeless people in dire need are sent. And later in the podcast with Beth Watts, I talk about this as well. What do it look like in Scotland then? Similarly difficult map to read, but you can look at this in more detail on the Scottish, Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation website. You see a very similar pattern. So deprivation is concentrated in our cities. So you've got Glasgow there, big blob of red there. When the first Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation was created in 2004, uh, over half of the most deprived neighbourhoods in Scotland were in Glasgow. So massive concentration of deprived neighbourhoods in Glasgow because of the decline, wider decline of industry across the Clyde. You've got a few scattered around Edinburgh. In Edinburgh, you get these sort of big suburban council estates like Wester Hales, Muir House, and Craig Miller. So that's why all the docks in Edinburgh are out, down the outside, because if you know Edinburgh, you've got the new town in the city centre there, which is definitely not deprived. And then if you, if I jump up and down, you've got Dundee there at the top as well. And if I, 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 if I scale this map out big enough to get Aberdeen in, um, it would have been too small to see anything, but Aberdeen's got a few deprived neighbourhoods in it as well. It's fine. So, so, how does this multiple deprivation work? So, what they do is collect a range of administrative data, and I think the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation has about 45 different indicators in it. And they divide the country up into little areas. So, in Scotland, they're called data zones, with an average population of 1,000. And they get the indicators and then basically they index them and rank them and do fancy statistics and basically every neighbourhood, all of those data zones in Scotland is ranked from 1 to, I used to know this off by heart, it used to be 6,505 but it's now more than that, it's now 6,780 something I think. Um, and so I think one's the most deprived, which this, the, this year was Fergusley Park in Paisley, or one bit of Fergusley Park in Paisley, and the 6,000 odd is the least deprived. So that's how it works. It's just a range of different indicators. Well, the reason there. I was asking because a lot of the local authorities are actually pushing individuals out to um, the countryside areas. The ones that are, as in the homeless, they're trying to get them to take up social housing on the outskirts, which to me means they're actually spreading out the way, not getting them solved the problem, and just putting them somewhere else. So they're doing that, but they're exactly the excuses that will 
can can we park this conversation for workshops, please? Can I get on with the lecture? <laughs> But no, it's interesting. Well, so you have to. Well, this next slide just sorry. So, what in Scotland though? What we see is a different pattern with the way Scottish cities are have developed. So, in Scotland, it tends to be peripheral areas. So, it tends to be the big social housing estates around our cities. As I already mentioned, in Edinburgh, you've got Wester Hales, Newhouse, and Craig Miller. In Glasgow, it's the big four estates of John Chapel, Pollock, Castle Milk, and Easter House. It's predominantly social housing. It's either housing owned by local authorities or council uh, or, or uh, housing associations, rather than private rented or owner occupied housing. It was formerly and still is sort of, uh, dominated by the white working class, and it tends to be in these central belt towns and cities. But the key message to take though from this, what this pattern of deprivation in Scotland shows us, is we have deprived neighbourhoods in Scotland because we put all our social housing in one place. Social housing is the housing you access when you are experiencing poverty, exclusion or other problems. That's what the index of multiple deprivation measures. So therefore, if you put all of it in one place, you're going to create a concentration of those people. So there's nothing inherent about the neighbourhood apart from the fact we put all our social housing in one place. So imagine the, the metaphor I use when I talk about this to policymakers is imagine you've got a bucket of apples and you fill it full of apples. Then the reason those apples are there is because the bucket's there. It's nothing inherent with the apples. It's just because you put all the bucket, all the apples in the bucket. Is that I, that's the issue that's happening here? That's the pattern we see in Scotland. We also get though, and the issue of homophily, and this is it about cheese lovers. My little mouse down there. Um, this is the fact in pure geography that we like to live with people like ourselves. So I talk, uh, talk about England, you have these ethnically diverse neighbourhoods that are deprived. People from ethnic minorities, recent migrants, like to live with people from the same ethnic group or similarly recent migrants because they know their culture, they're having the same experiences out of them. Similarly, white people, we are racist because we're brought up in a racist society, so we don't like to live around uh, people who aren't white. See this most dramatically in uh, America. And there's a really nice, you find online versions of this. It's a game where you, ha you have different coloured um, red uh, dots, and you, you give them a preference of how many of the different colour they'd like to live with, and then you set them moving. And no matter, even if you set it so that they want to live with people of, this, of different colours, they do eventually end up becoming segregated. We just do it. It's what happens. It also happens with socioeconomic status as well, that people who are uh, poorer would like to live with people who are also poorer, people who are richer like to live with richer people. So you can see the underlying trend that's pushing this, is the fact that our individual actions, we like to live with people like ourselves. <coughs> so that's what causes the, the urban problem then, that's why this problem emerges. So why is it a social policy problem? Why are we interested in social policy terms? Well, it's because of things like this. This is a document produced by the local authority improvement service, or local government improvement service in Scotland in 2010. Negative and positive outcomes are highly varied between small areas and highly clustered within small areas. So it's like they're making it, these outcomes of these individuals are problematic. We need to do something about this. The French geographer Henri Lefebvre talks about this wonderfully. One occasionally hears talk of a pathology of space, of alien neighbourhoods and so on. This kind of phraseology makes it easy for people who use it, architects, urbanists or planners, suggest the idea that they are in effect doctors of space. What he's getting at here is basically we're interested in the urban problem, or the urban problem becomes a social policy problem because we can then 
think about, well, can we solve it? It gives policymakers the power to then try and solve it. And it, I end up becoming the focus of so much policy problem because it's, it is just bleeding obvious, basically. It, it's out there. When you look at these deprived neighbourhoods, they look unpleasant. You want to do something about them. And it looks like you should just be able to go into these areas, give them a lick of paint, give the residents a kick at the backside, and tickety boo, everything's fine. We've got rid of the urban problems. It looks easy to fix. But, and this is where the rest of the lecture goes, it's not as easy as it appears. So it's, it looks like an easy fix, but it's not as easy as it fix. First of all, some very, very basic facts. First of all, most poor people, most people experiencing poverty, do not live in the most deprived neighbourhoods. Although the most deprived neighbourhoods are a particular concentration of poverty, most people experiencing poverty live elsewhere. So if you're trying to cure poverty by chucking resources at neighbourhoods, you're going to miss most people experiencing poverty. And in fact, when you look at the data down to a neighbourhood level, you often end up with you have some very, very rich people living in these deprived neighbourhoods as well. But the main reason is that the problems that afflict these neighbourhoods are actually out with the neighbourhood. And yet the, the way policy is framed, it makes them seem as though they are problems within the neighbourhood. But it's actually wider problems that just happen to manifest themselves in these particular neighbourhoods. But this ease with which it looks like a, uh, a problem to fix means that we end up with a plethora of policies. And this is where I could get really boring. But, so these are some of the policies that have been around over the last 30 years in, to do with uh, poor, poor neighbourhoods in the UK. So we had education priority areas, community development pro uh, pro projects, urban priority uh, areas, inner area, inner area studies, urban development corporations, housing action trusts, new life partnerships, uh, the uh, city challenge partnerships, single regeneration budgets, um, health action zones, education action zones, employment action zones, priority, priority partnership areas, small urban renewal initiatives, new deal for communities, social inclusion partnerships, and, uh, neighborhood renewal partnerships, housing market renewal partnerships, urban regeneration programs, personal neighborhood services funds, uh, regeneration outcome agreements, and Jessica Spruce, which I can't remember what it stands for at all. <gasps> and other new ones No. <laughs> <laughs> well, in 2013 paper on this, I make the point that these policies are now ended, thank God. <laughs> you don't need to memorise that list, don't worry. It's just my, um, my party trick for this lecture. So, yeah, governments bloody love these policies. They've been doing them EPAs. That was 1968. Jessica Spruce, Scottish Government, in 2010. They've been going at this for bloody decades. And we still have deprived neighbourhoods. <clears throat> what these policies have in common is they are what we term area-based initiatives. And they're led by central government, so either Westminster or the Scottish government goes, hey, we are going to solve your problems. We will come into your neighbourhood, but only for a set amount of time. You have to sort yourself out in five, three, five or ten years. And we will give you this money. And the idea behind that money, it often looks like a lot of money. So Community Regeneration Fund, which is the last big one in Scotland that was 2006 to 2009, that was £345 million. Pounds. Sounds enormous. 0.1% of the Scottish Government's budget for that period. Absolutely feck all in the big scheme of things. And the idea behind it is it's catalyst funding. So let's just give a little bit of money, slap some paint on some doors, and tickety-boo, everything will be fine. People go, ooh, I've got a new, new door, I've got to get a job. They tend to focus on physical change and renewal because, <laughs> I joke about painting doors and things, but that's really what it looks like in practice, uh, because A, residents like it, that's the problem residents face on their doorstep, but B, also makes the politicians look like they're doing something to actually solve the problems. So if you uh, pull down some council flats and build some nice new homes and build a new park, everybody's like, yay, they're doing something. And the other, and this is kind of a bigger thing, and I touched on this in the lecture on the Scottish approach to policy making, is they often, and they were pioneers in partnership working and 
the Lacanese joined, joined the government. So the issues in the neighbourhood are seen as wicked issues. So you have problems like concentrated unemployment, and that's linked to low educational attainment. The fact that often these neighbourhoods aren't on public transport routes, or they're very distant from employment locations. And also, many of the people who have been unemployed for a long time have mental health issues. And uh, so what are you going to do about this? You've got all these interlinked problems. These are wicked issues. So you need, you need all these different bits of government working together, working with households, working in the neighbourhood to solve the way these problems all pile up on top of one another. So this is area-based initiatives. And in practice, this is an example of one. It's a, I've done a lot of research in Wester Hales, which is Wester Hales outside Edinburgh. In the 1970s, it looked like that. So pretty rank high-rise blocks. Uh, those particular high-rise blocks in Westburn had plastic downpipes running through them. So if there's a fire in one of the lower down flats, it would just shoot up the downpipe, sort of burning the downpipe and spread throughout the entire block. So they were demolished in the 1990s, middle photo here. Uh, because they were deep, they were just awful, they just needed to be demolished. And now, um, whenever I visit deprived neighbourhoods, the sun comes out, uh, it seems. This is what Wester Hayes looks like to, today. After 10 years of investment in the 1990s, the canal was reopened. Through it, you have some lovely new housing from Prospect Housing Association. I am the treasurer of Prospect Housing Association. And the council put some nice new cladding on their books of flats at the back and put the concierge service and manage the flats a lot better. So that's what these area-based initiatives look like in practice. In, in, in implementing these area-based initiatives, the governments have to construct the neighbourhoods, in a, they have to construct them as a problem. They have to say, right, here's a problem in these neighbourhoods, we have to do something about it. And over time, the way governments have done this has changed. So, Rob Atkinson, in his paper in 2005, talked about in the 1960s, the focus was on, it, on ethnicity. The urban problem was an English problem, it was an inner city problem, so the problem focused on immigration and ethnicity. In my work in, published in 2010, focusing on Scotland, I looked at these discourses, the policy language, in more detail. And so it's a quote from a Scottish executive document Better communities in Scotland closed the gap in 2010. People in deprived communities are also more likely to rely on public services as their only safety net when things go wrong. They are less likely to have assets such as savings or property or a salary they can use to take out a loan to help them meet the, meet the repayments. Also, their social networks will not give them access to jobs and other opportunities that are available to other people. So this is the Scottish Government in the policy document describing this problem of neighbourhoods. Now I want to unpick this with you in and say, demonstrate to you why this is problematic. So a bit of engagement now, get off your phones. People in deprived communities are also more likely to rely on public services as their only safety net. Right, who went to a school funded by the state here? So not a private school, who went to state school here? Right, who uses the NHS for your GP and any other services you get? Yeah. So who's relying on public services here, really? We all are. So this, in this one sentence, they are artists, they are made, they are othering people in deprived neighbourhoods by saying they rely on public services. No! Everybody bloody relies on public services in Scotland. And that's why you're sat in a sodding room was owned by a publicly funded university. Because you are relying on public services at this po point. We don't make you problematic because you're a middle class student. Well, I know many of you are, but you, you know what I'm getting at. <laughs> so we're in that first sentence. The Scottish, the Scottish executive back then are making problematic assumptions about people who live in these neighbourhoods. What about the assets one owns? So who owns their own home here? Hands up if you own your own home. 
deathly silence. Oh, now we have one here. <laughs> the joys of having a mixed student care award. You have one person. Who, so yeah, you are the only person who has access. The rest of us are rigid, lazy bastards who live in private neighbourhoods. So again, this ignores the fact that 30, at the time this was written, 30% of people in Scotland rented their home from a council or a housing association. So they did not own their own assets. That's not a particular problem with deprived neighbourhoods. That's just people who want to be able to afford to rent their homes affordably. There's nothing wrong with that. That's a perfectly sensible thing to aspire to. This, there's, that's, one, that's a very, very policy-focused way of how these problem uh, populations are created. But this is continuing, this is a policy exchange, a right-wing think tank, um, so, so this construction policy problems has continued um, onwards and still happens today. So the states of many of Britain's social housing estates are nothing short of a national embarrassment. Too often crime, unemployment, gangs and violence are rife. The human cost is heartbreaking. The cost of public purse immense. There is hope, however. Targeted interventions driven by de dedicated individuals can make an enormous difference. So it's that, again, defining the problem in a particular way and then linking the solution at the end of it. Right, okay, we've got these, pro these problems that happen, it's appear to be in these neighbourhoods. If we just target them, we can solve them. Right. What is this bloody wrong then? Right. <laughs> the very shit school of policy making. What happened? Why, do they, why have we had 40 years of these policies? Why have they not made a blind bit of difference? So this discourse of policy binds the problem in the neighbourhood itself, or in the residence. It's saying, you residents, you are committing antisocial behaviour. You are unemployed because you live in this neighbourhood. You are relying on public services because you're lazy. And so it finds this problem in the particular neighbourhood. So therefore it applies the fix to that neighbourhood. That small amount of investment is applied to the neighbourhood. But the trouble is, the problem is not actually in the neighbourhood. Poverty, as I talked about before the reading week, is a widespread problem in our society. It is caused by the wider socio-economic inequality and social exclusion in society. When we look at those maps, the national maps of deprivation, deprivation is associated with deindustrialization. It's associated with wider structural changes in the economy is not down to the people who live in the neighbourhood. But also, yes, so you've got these particular concentrations of poverty, so you do something about them in the neighbourhood, you run an employment project to get all the people back at work. Really, there's actually really good evidence that if you put employment projects in deprived neighbourhoods, you will lower unemployment because a lot of these people are disengaged in the labour market. Trouble is, if you live in a crap neighbourhood, you get a job and you get more money, what do you do? You put it off! Because you don't want to stay in the neighbourhood. So a lot of these policies as well have what we term linkage. As soon as you apply this solution to the people, they go, ooh, I'm not poor anymore, I'm going to go rent this better house, or buy this better house that's not in the neighbourhood. And then lo and behold, they move out and somebody else moves in who was in the same state that that person was in before you applied your intervention. People are static. They flow through these neighbourhoods. So lo and behold, because you've defined your policy problem incorrectly, 40 years of doing this over and over again and hitting our heads against a bloody big wall, your policy is continually failing because of the way we define the policy problem. And just as an aside, this is my greatest claim to fame. This lecture <laughs> appears on a BuzzFeed listicle, <laughs> so I think that deserves a Taylor Swift gift of congratulations on my part. So if maybe at the back of taking a photo, you can put it on another listicle for next year. <laughs> so, 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 neighborhood policies aren't going to work. That's the message of this lecture, really. So, so Deprived neighbourhoods exist because we put all our social housing in one place. If we define the problem in the neighbourhood, but it's not actually there, and try and solve the problem in the neighbourhood, then we are not going to solve these problems long term. So, what might we do? How actually might we solve the problems of deprived neighbourhoods? There are problems of, of neighbourhoods. And I, and I get quite angry 
with some scholars who um, don't fully appreciate the everyday privations of living in a deprived neighbourhood, of actually living with regular youth antisocial behaviour. And the youth antisocial behaviour isn't caused because the youth are particularly horrible, it's caused because there's the fact that deprived neighbourhoods tend to have a younger population profile. There's just more children there, and more young, young kids there. And because usually they're because, they're because a lot of their parents are in low-paid jobs struggle to find because the job market is so bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, the, so and the, the kids don't live a brilliant life because the, the neighbourhood might be distant from the local lane local markets. Their parents might have ended up renting the home there because they haven't got brilliant education qualifications and they're not in a high-paid job. Uh, they're in a very low-skilled job and they keep cycling in and out of employment. So, and also, if you, particularly in the UK, we're bad at this, the neighbourhoods are marked by public sector disinvestment. They look pretty ropey. And it's not, you should, nobody should have to live in a neighbourhood that looks bad. And many of these neighbourhoods do just look bad. They're not clean, they're not tidy, and the housing is of poor quality. So what do you do about this? Well, first of all, you need adequate investment an adequate expenditure and management. And this needs to be more than just that sort of kind of the paint in the doors of the area-based initiatives. This needs to be ongoing investment. And also reflect the fact that the deprived neighbourhoods have more need in terms of service delivery. So my uh, PhD supervising colleague at the University of Glasgow, Matt Hastings, has done some brilliant work on this looking at everyday environmental services, so things like street sweeping and uh, clearing up dumped waste and things like that. And she highlights how there are many structural causes why deprived neighbourhoods end up looking less tidy. So they tend to have a much higher population density than affluent neighbourhoods. So you have more people there going through the neighbourhood who are going to create more waste. because. Just to stand on a street for five minutes and watch people and see how dirty the average person is in Britain in terms of dropping litter. And that could be in the central Glasgow or Edinburgh as much as it will be in a deprived neighbourhood. Also, people who live in deprived neighbourhoods are more likely to experience in poverty, so are more likely to end up buying poor quality household goods. So they're not going to last as long, so they're going to end up having to get rid of them. And if you can't pay the local council £20 to pick up your, your broken sofa, what are you going to do? Well, you're just going to dump it on, your on, on the street and walk away. Also, many deprived neighbourhoods, because of the stigma associated with them, also become the focus of local people just dumping things on, in the neighbourhood. And I, I live in Leith in Edinburgh, and this happens in our neighbourhood, where local business people come round and just dump rubbish in our bins, thinking that they can because it's lethal and nobody will care. So there is greater need in these neighbourhoods. The services have a greater demand put on them and the service needs to match that demand. The level of investment needs to be there to make sure it's keeping on top of these problems. Otherwise, you end up in a sort of broken windows thesis issue of well, if, if nobody's looking after the neighbourhood, well, I won't bother looking after the neighbourhood. I'll just leave it looking crap as well, if the council won't. This is the responsibility for local authorities, because with this all this cutback and the steady measures, because the council... Yeah, so these, are, so these are local authority services, but still, and again, and Matt Hastings' work shows it dramatically, that local authorities most local authorities spend more money in affluent neighbourhoods than they do in deprived neighbourhoods on these very everyday services. What else might you do? We well, might as well, what I argue, is co-produce services <coughs> to work with local communities to ensure that you are delivering the type of neighbourhood that the, they want to live in. So if there's a problem with the management of green space and you are spending a small fortune as a local authority tidying that up, cutting the grass all the time, you might want to work with the local community and say, well, what, what would you want in that? And they, they might say, oh, right, okay, want some growing areas. We've got 
<coughs> we live in flats, we've got no gardens, we want to grow some vegetables. Put in some growing boxes, some allotments, and lo and behold, you've reduced the cost of delivering the services yourself, the neighbourhood, the community are managing that space themselves, <coughs> and particularly because it's supported by the local communities, you'll make an ongoing improvement to that neighbourhood. So you're not just applying a fix and presuming it's the right one, you're actually listening to what people need and providing a level of service that they want and can respond, will respond to positively. But it's also it's important to recognise, and I've banged about this, that the problem is are, they're in a neighbourhood and they can be solved there temporarily. And that once you apply that solution and people move away and the neighbourhood population changes, the chances are that problem will re-emerge. So actually what's needed is not policy focused on specific neighbourhood. It's more the joining up between national policy and strategic, wider regional policy and local policy. So in terms of the national level, Proper actions to tackle poverty, as I shouted out before the uh, reading week. At a regional level, make sure that job opportunities are there for people to access. Make sure the transport links are there so people can get from their deprived neighbourhood to the job opportunities that are available in the local lane market. And then at a local level, ensure that you are working with the people who live in these neighbourhoods to get the training and skills they need to access these opportunities at that wider strategic level. So that's, in my humble opinion, that's what an effective so urban policy would look like. And that's not what we do because of the way we define the policy problem. However, just to throw in a bit of a swirl ball at the end, <coughs> there is this thing called neighbourhood effects. This is the theory that it actually might be worse to live in a deprived neighbourhood. That if you are experiencing poverty and you live in a deprived neighbourhood, then it might lower your chances of leaving poverty. Not because of anything about the neighbourhood, because of the people you live with. Really difficult stuff. Really, really complex stuff. Very politically contentious. And also the social science around it is incredibly uh, complex. But it's basically the idea that, yeah, if you live in a neighborhood of concentrated deprivation, then the poverty that everybody around you is experiencing might lower your aspirations. And therefore you might not get that job. You might not want to go for that job. You might not bother going to school because nobody else around you is going for school. To school. The evidence around this, though, is very mixed. It's stronger in the US. In the US, there's, there's quite strong evidence because the concentration of deprivation in the US in the cities is so great that in the US, neighborhood effects do exist. In the UK, we tend to see it in terms of health behaviors. So quite strong evidence around health behaviors that if you live in a neighborhood with high concentration of people smoking, it will increase your likelihood to smoke because you see it as normal. There's a really disturbing one I, I heard about that in some neighbourhoods in Scotland it's become a norm that young mothers smoke because there's a myth that it reduces the size of your baby and therefore makes labour less painful. It doesn't. It adds massively to the complications of your pregnancy and the complications that your child will face in later life. But that's a kind of the, what we mean by neighbourhood effects. <clears throat> but I just want to leave it there, though, with neighbourhood effects, because if we accept that neighbourhood effects do exist, then that might completely change how we do neighbourhood policy. But I just want to leave you hanging on that point. So here's just some links for you to look up later. For the English I, I, um, Index of Multiple Declaration, Alistair Ray at the University of Sheffield, he does some brilliant mapping you can look at. For Scotland, have a look at the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation website. You can look at your own neighbourhood, find out how deprived your neighbourhood is. 
So, just to sum up then, so what you should know from this lecture, why some neighbourhoods are deprived, so wider socioeconomic problems like deindustrialization and disinvestment. You should understand how policymakers misunderstand this, or how they understand it and get it wrong. What policymakers have done about this in terms of area-based initiatives, why this doesn't work, and also what might work in terms of effective urban policy. Thank you very much.